So <clears throat> I want to thank for the invitation to Sydney Ideas. It's great to be on campus. It's my first visit here, although I visited uh, Sydney once before, some 15 years ago. Um, I have four key points uh, relating to the role of the humanities and the social sciences in environmental discourse and on the one hand and, and the entanglement of bodies and environments. I'm kind of squeezing the human body into the environmental domain. Uh, it complicates the story significantly because it invites questions of alienation and ethics. I won't say much about those questions though, but it does relate to what John referred to as sustainable re relationship and, and quite seriously in a way. So, <clears throat> I hope this works. Where is the receiver of my signal? It reminds me of an old song, Operator, Operator, give me Jesus on the line, somehow. <laughs> There's no signal, no line. Okay. Uh, so that's my first message. Uh, the post-war framing of the environment has been faithfully reduced to an object of natural science. It, has, it is becoming clear that this framing is itself part of the environmental problem because what currently counts as environmental is also social. Humanity's knowledge enterprise needs to return, to its return its attention to social theory and the humanities. Is this working or? Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, uh, the way in which we model the environment is uh, informative about how we speak about uh, uh, humans and the rest of the, uh, the scheme. Naturally, that's why we model, that's the whole point. And this is the old framing of, of, of humans in the environmental domain. And, and it's made in 1986, the famous Bretherton diagram of, of uh, ecological analysis. And this is, by the way, a, a, a simplified version. Uh, there is a vastly more complicated version. And in that version, the role of humans is even smaller and insignificant. So clearly, the human element is, is uh, marginalized. It's a side issue. I mean, forget it almost. And you can model things without considering humans. Um, recently. Uh, another model was developed by the International Human Dimension Program on Global Environmental Change, 2010. And this is one of a series of messages. The, the key point here is that there is a significant space for the social sciences and the humanities, namely in dealing with the responses to the environmental problems. So the argument is, if you want to understand human behavior, you have to which is a part of the whole chain, you, you of course have to have the humanities and the social sciences involved. Um, and now we live in the so-called Anthropocene. Uh, and I think that uh, precisely because of the Anthropocene, something more is needed. I mean, these old models, even the, the second model from 2010, which I shown is, is getting heavily outdated. Human signatures are everywhere and we have to focus on that. 
Uh, of course, it's not. It, it, the point has been made that the notion of the Anthropocene is a bit anthropocentric. I mean, it's not just us. The planet isn't ours, and, and to understand it, we, we have to consider other things as, as well. But our role is somewhat specific. Um, and the arguments and points I've been uh, mentioning uh, derive from a paper which is uh, going to be published in Environmental Science and, and Policy. It's part of a, a two-year project called RESCUE. It's an acronym. Uh, funded by the European Science Foundation, uh, mostly. And, and the paper is written by uh, uh, social scientists and humanities scholars from various countries in Europe and, and one American. Uh, and the whole point was to reconceptualize Anthropos uh, in a way which would be relevant for the, the Anthropocene and, and to outline how the humanities and the social sciences might be uh, important for, for, for contributing to environmental discourse. This is a, an old image uh, from 1997. It's a, I frequently use it because I think it's so powerful for illuminating uh, the environmental age. It's, uh, the artist is clearly telling us something. Uh, uh, he reverses the roles of humans and, and, and animals, lobsters in this case. The, the lobster is uh, speculating on, on the menu while humans are trapped in the tank. And it forces us to, to think beyond the aquarium, as I call it. And, and uh, this is a kind of a critique of the modernist take of the environment. And if there is a postmodern uh, take on the environment, it will have to have humans in the tank and to, to recognize that every human account is necessarily situated somewhere. It's not out of the tank. Uh, point two, um, the new era characterized by measurable global human impact, the so-called Anthropocene implies a radical change in perspective and action in terms of human awareness of and responsibility for a vulnerable Earth. And something big is brewing, and, and we, the authors of this paper, suggest that we go back to a famous uh, notion by philosopher Hannah Arendt, uh, the notion of the human condition. Uh, she was referring to the Nazi era and the Holocaust, and we suggesting the concept may be useful to deal with the place of humans in, in, uh, in the, the Anthropocene, namely the new human condition. And the challenge for humanity scholars and, and social scientists is to outline and define uh, what the new human condition is and, and to, to deal with it for in terms of practical action. Uh, point three, one important domain for environmental research is the entanglement of bodies and environments. The environment is literally embodied in humans through social practices and epigenetic processes. And moreover, humans themselves partly consist of microbial ecosystems. An important issue now is to broaden the notion, notions of anthropos to allow, allow for such conflation and fussiness. Um, I bring into the discussion this uh, uh, funny cartoon. It may not sound funny to you, but if you know the saga, you may appreciate the humor. A year ago, uh, uh, it was discovered that the importers of salt in Iceland were using so-called road salt, which is used for defreezing uh, roads in winter, selling it for the production of food. And you can imagine what happened when people realized that the salt in their bread, in their meat, and, and the rest of it has been, uh, 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 that's the cheapest salt on the international market. It's road salt, in, industrial salt, and uh, so people uh, started to ask what's happening to our bodies. Uh, will we discover, or maybe uh, the second or third generation, the impact, etc. And there were debates on, on European standards. 
there's a lot of them, on uh, national agencies, etc. There was a lot of humor too, and, and here we have uh, in the cartoon a baker who is competing for salt, gave me my salt when the road constructors or transport people are, are using it for other purposes. Um, so this uh, brings up the issue of the porosity of the body. Uh, after all, there's a lot of material flow through us and, and we literally are uh, relational flows. Um, and epigenetics tries to deal with the impact of the environment, which is hereditary, which is not stored in the, in the DNA material, but nevertheless may uh, 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 bring on impacts for the second and third and fourth generations. Uh, next slide, and I'm almost done. Um, this is, uh, uh, so the, the point of epigenetics and, and road salt illustrates partly the way in which our bodies are situated in environments that are fleeting. Uh, the business with microbes also underlines our relationality to, to the rest. There's a growing field of microbiotics. We are microbes in a sense, and uh, much of our body mass is, is microbes, mainly in our guts, and, and, and most of our DNA is, those, is that of microbes. And there's a lot of uh, research going on now, partly in medicine relating to that. And again, this is the fleeting body, sustaining bodies, uh, uh, and, and this is what I meant with uh, sustainable relationships, and we need to maintain this on my own. And this is my final slide. Uh, one more. The collapsing of body, society, and environment necessarily invites uh, applying the governmental gaze throughout from the cellular to the global level. The challenge now for anthropology and related disciplines is to document these developments in different contexts to theorize the significance and to explore what they imply for notions of the human, hierarchies of what I call biosocial relations and governance. At the moment, we have kind of two separate discourses on, on governance. On the one hand, we have the, the resources and commons discourse of, of, of uh, the Ostrom team, for instance. And on the other hand, we have discourse on, on, uh, on the body. Uh, Sheila Jasonov uh, uh, is one example. She speaks of bioconstitutionalism. And, and my point is that, strangely enough, these discourses do not seem to meet. We theorize commons, resources, environments on the one hand, and human bodies and, and medicine and, and the rest of it on the other. And, and, and the, the key people do not cite each other, and, and, and I'm suggesting we need one discourse because the body is environment and, and part of the environment. Uh, so I hope that bringing in the body uh, underlines the, the, uh, uh, the notion that uh, we need to think about uh, sustainable materialism and, and, and everyday life at, at the same time. I think I'm done. Thank you.